Will everybody please stand for the posting of colors? Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Pastor Darcy Wiedner from Calverly South to come up and give us a welcome.
Good afternoon. Welcome. And thank you to everyone for being here today. We consider it a privilege to open our home to each of you here at Calvary South OC as we honor and commemorate the life of Ronnie Jack Coleman. Our prayer is that this will be a memorable ceremony as we reflect upon his life. And we are grateful that we could be a part of making that happen here today. So with that, I would like to introduce the Master of Ceremonies, retired State Fire Marshal, Dennis Matheson. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dennis Matheson, retired State Fire Marshal, and I have the pleasure of being your MC this afternoon. It is wonderful to see so many fire service friends and family members here in support of Chief Coleman and his family. I'm sure he is smiling upon us know, knowing it is he that got us all together today. It is an absolute honor to stand here before you and be part of this amazing celebration of life for Chief Ron Coleman as we pay respect to a man who touched so many of us throughout our lives and our careers. At this time, I'd like to introduce Fire Chaplain Kent Craning for scripture reading and opening prayer. First Corinthians 13, verses four through seven, read this way. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It's not proud, it doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and always perseveres. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these encouraging words. Thank you that you are the author of love. And we ask that this family, the Coleman family, may feel your love today. We are grateful for all those across this great state and representing so many departments and agencies that have come together to honor the life of Ronnie Jack Coleman and to bless his family for their sacrifice as well. May they sense your presence and feel our sincere gratitude. We ask your blessing on this celebration of life. May all we do and say today pay tribute to a life lived in service of others. We ask these things in your most holy name. Amen. When Marie asked me to be here today, I had no idea what I would say. I know, me, speechless, right? I began to reflect on Ron's life accomplishments. I reread his biography and thought about words and phrases that made me think of him and his character. Here are just a few. Lead from the front. Wisdom. Mentor. Historian. Future thinker. Well-rounded driven towards constant improvement and growth. Author, education is a lifetime experience, firm but fair, giving, accessible, dignified, eloquent, relationship builder, visionary, motivational, and friend. As we progress through today's program, I am sure you will hear some of these attributes sprinkled throughout our speaker's comments. With that said, it is my honor to introduce our speakers today. I'm going to list all of them, and then one by one, we'll, we'll come up after each other. Our first speaker will be Chief Daniel Berlant, our current acting State Fire Marshal, followed by retired State Fire Marshal Chief Mike Richwine, and then retired Fire Chief Randy Brugman, followed by Dave Long, a lifelong friend of Ron's, and then Dr. Dennis O'Neill, former U.S. Deputy Fire Administrator and National Fire Academy Superintendent. We'll begin with Chief Roland.
Well, good afternoon. Uh, first, for uh, Marie, uh, uh, Ronnie's children, family, uh, friends, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, on behalf of the state of California, uh, on behalf of uh, the men and women of the former department that he worked for, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, our director, Joe Tyler, our entire uh, Office of State Fire Marshal staff. We want to pass on to all of you our deepest uh, condolences for the loss of your husband, your father, your beloved family member, and for all of us, uh, a friend. You know, I believe we all want to live a life uh, that means something, a life uh, where we make a difference, uh, a life where we leave a legacy. And for Chief Coleman, there is no doubt in this room that he is leaving us with an impactful legacy. Now, throughout uh, today, you're going to hear from Chief Coleman's family, uh, friends, fire service protégés, uh, and the ongoing theme, uh, no doubt, will be highlighting the extensive list of the Chief's accomplishments. But it's important that we pause today and take note that these achievements are not just past tense. They are not just history. They transition now to legacy. You know, in the coming months, a fire chief is going to be recognized for their career accomplishments, uh, where the Center for the Public Safety Excellence will award this fire chief uh, the Ronnie Jack Coleman Leadership Award, recognizing the superior leadership and actions because of the training standards set by Chief Coleman. This fire chief, they will be recognized through Chief Coleman's legacy. Today, there are firefighters across our nation who will respond to a fire. They will don a helmet using technology founded by Chief Coleman. Their lives will be made safer today and into the future through Chief Coleman's legacy. Tomorrow, a young family somewhere in our state will sadly have a fire at their home. They will safely escape unharmed because their home residential fire sprinklers from the advocacy of Chief Coleman and now the California requirement for them to be in new homes this family is still alive through Chief Coleman's legacy. So I'm proud to say that these contributions uh, today provide us at the Office of the State Fire Marshal, uh, our employees, it provides us the foundation that we can build upon. A foundation that the California Fire Service uh, in totality can build upon. And really a foundation used internationally based on the legacy of Chief Coleman. You know, in, in May of this year, we celebrated our office's centennial anniversary, and we were honored uh, to host many of our former state fire marshals, uh, including Chief Coleman. And we had the opportunity to listen to them and to him and to talk and hear about their accomplishments during their tenure as the state fire marshal. And looking back on it, Chief Coleman's words that day will be imprinted into many of us for the years to come. You know, the Roman philosopher uh, Cicero once said, the life of the dead is placed in the memory of the living. And so there is no question that while Chief Coleman is no longer with us, his passion, his work, his efforts leave us that legacy that lives on. It's now my honor uh, to introduce one of those protégés of Chief Coleman and my predecessor, retired State Fire Marshal Michael Richwine. Good afternoon. Chief Ronnie J. Coleman was an energetic and transformative leader devoting more than 65 years of his life to the fire service. In 1992, he was appointed to serve as a state fire marshal under Governor Pete Wilson and did so honorably for eight years. Early in his term as state fire marshal, the chief recognized that the Office of the State Fire Marshal as an essential department would be better served by consolidation into a larger state agency. And so he proposed the bold move to consolidate the Office of the State Fire Marshal into the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, known today as CAL FIRE. In his career, Chief Coleman was at the forefront of many advances in firefighter training, leadership, fire prevention, and technical innovation. He was an advocate for residential sprinklers 
and as a fire chief, created one of the first ordinances requiring fire sprinklers in new homes. He led the way for many years, and today, residential fire sprinkler systems are required in all new homes. Chief Coleman's commitment to the fire service is also acknowledged by his decades of work to improve and provide access to training and education. He provided leadership and guidance as a training officer representing Costa Mesa Fire Department, the fire chief of San Clemente and Fullerton Fire Departments, and, the chair, and as the chair of our statewide training education advisory committee, which is advisory to our training program under the state fire marshal. And under his leadership, he guided state fire training through many substantial changes that included the creation of the fire chief certification process, which led to the national professional credentialing under the Center for Public Safety Excellence. He created, or he was intimately involved in, and it was his vision that um, our firefighter certification program would receive international and national accreditation. And it was his vision to establish the California Fire Academy accreditation system. Chief Coleman was an entrepreneur, an innovator, and as you all know, he was a historian. He had a prolific knowledge of the fire service's origins and practices, and his favorite historical leader was Ben Franklin, the father of the fire service in this country. I can still hear him talking about Los Angeles Fire Department Chief Engineer Ralph J. Scott and the study of a firefighter's occupation in the 1930s, which paved the way for standardized training in California. Or he would speak of Ed Bent and his contributions as a superintendent of training in the early years of the state system. Or how State Fire Marshal Phil Favreau saved state fire training when it was transitioned from the Department of Education to the office of the State Fire Marshal. Chief Coleman was gracious, humble, and always accessible. The chief was a mentor to me and many of us here. We sought his counseling regarding the politics of the job and the growing expectations or general career advice. And we were appreciative of his way of listening and providing his perspective and wisdom, yet allowing us to discover the correct actions to resolve our individual issues. Today, we list all the achievements and accolades in Chief Coleman's career, but I believe his greatest impact is in the lives of people, guiding them in their personal and professional development. Marie, we all recognize the Chief's success was directly due to your efforts as a partner in every aspect of his life. From keeping it light, being organized, and getting him out the door to where he needed to go next, we extend our genuine gratitude to you. On a personal note, <clears throat> I will always remember uh, my conversations with the Chief on road trips, um, meeting with fire chiefs, training officers, fire prevention officers, the hangouts underneath the trees in the backyard of Marie and Chief's home in Elk Grove, and lunch at his favorite, Burt's Diner. I will miss his humor, his wisdom, and most of all, his friendship. But I take solace in knowing the fire community will continue to honor him through the number of awards that are named after him, and that the next generation of firefighters and fire officers will come to know of his contributions to our profession. Chief Coleman's legacy will live on as an inspiration of ingenuity, vision, and commitment. Rest in peace, Chief. Now I'd like to introduce Randy Bregman, retired fire chief. Good afternoon. I first met Ron in 1985 when I approached him at a conference he was speaking at in Colorado about being a presenter 
a video series on leadership. I had just been promoted to company officer and he was already a nationally known fire chief. I thought it was a long shot that he would even engage with me. But he did and we sat for probably two hours that day. Uh, he was intrigued by the concept and he invited uh, my wife Susan and I to San Clemente. And that trip began, began a lifelong friendship with Ron and Marie. We developed that series called Making a Difference, the Fire Officer's Role, and it was pretty successful. After being promoted to battalion chief, within a week of that occurring, Ron called me. He said, I need you to do two things for me. He said, I need you to become a member of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, and I need you to come work with me on developing this accreditation process. While he framed the re request like I was doing him a favor, it was all about positioning me to have the opportunity to take the next step in my career. When we went, when we went to our first IFC conference, Ron and Marie went out of their way to introduce us to everybody that they could. I remember walking back from that, uh, uh, the presidential celebration that night and Susan looked over at me and she said, you're gonna do this, aren't you? Running for president of the IFC. It was in 2002 that Ron, Ron was the one that swore me into that position. You see, he had planted the seed that evening. That's what he did. Ron changed the trajectory, uh, tra trajectory of my life as he has for so many. As he opened many doors that helped me professionally, was my mentor, my friend, and our lives have been intertwined for over 38 years, and Ron Marie, Ron and Marie have become part of our family. But I was just one of thousands that he did that for. Most of us here today either have a credential or a certification that has Ron's name signed at the bottom of it, or it is one that he had helped develop or implement uh, uh, during his time as state fire marshal or with CPSC. As Mike said, he was our Ben Franklin of the 20th century. And like Franklin, his influence and legacy will live on for centuries to come. When I think of Ron's legacy, it's not only in the programs and models that he helped to develop, but uh, that really have helped to shape what the uh, current fire service looks like today. But he had a unique talent to help others go where they would not have gone themselves by providing instruction, professional insights, opportunity for engagement, and above all, support. Ron was also an historian and a collector of fire memorabilia, and if you've ever been in his warehouse, you know how much he had collected over the years. But he loved his challenge coins. The challenge coin, which is Many of us know date back to World War I and as a means of identification if one was captured, being embossed with the uh, insignia of the uh, squadron that that person was assigned. But as, as we now know, that tradition is carried throughout the military but also throughout the public safety. Ron was an avid collector. And, and I would ask him where, he, where each coin came from. And you know what? Each one had a story. And he remembered most, mostly where those coins came from. Ron always shared two things that we all can do in life no matter what our position. It's to pay it forward to others and leave it better than we found it. I know he tried to do that and would often express if we would just each do that every day, we would make the world in which we live a much better place to live. So true. I'd like to end today with a final thought. And this is a verse adapted from a poem by Linda Ellis called The Dash. I am the man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke that the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that Ron spent alive on this earth. And now only those who loved him know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters most is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this, as Ron would say, 
Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what is true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's action to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Ron, as I reflect today on your dash, your life has lifted each one of us up. As Ben Franklin wrote, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you were, you were gone, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. Chief Coleman, mission accomplished. Thank you for being the beacon of our profession, for your friendship, for your wisdom, for our long conversations in your living room. I love you. I'm going to miss you a lot. God bless you, my friend. Now I'd like to introduce David Long. I'm shorter than most people. I probably have known Ron Coleman longer than anyone in this room. We met in the summer of 1952 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I had just moved into a house that backed onto a corral owned by a kid friend of ours, Doug Catchings. And I caught the sense of something going on in the corral that day and I walked out in the backyard and there was Ron in the corral beating up my little brother and I leaped over the fence into the corral it had rained for two or three four days before that the corral was mud and pulled him off my little brother and we got into one heck of a fist fight and then it became a wrestling match, and we rolled around in the mud. I had him in a hammer lock, and he had me in a headlock. And it was a stalemate. And one of us said, I'll let go if you'll let go. And the other one said, you let go first. Ultimately, we both let go. And sitting in the mud, covered in mud, he said, my name's Ron Coleman, what's yours? And that was the start of a 71-year-old friendship. We had many wonderful adventures in Tulsa as we were growing up. We had a wonderful snake collection, which, much to my mother's dismay, were kept in cages that we built out of orange crates and screen wire and kept in our garage. He's the only person I know that I have ever spent three days and two nights in jail. Now, Ron was, and he never let me forget this, he was 364 days older than I was. And we had decided in the summer of 1953 that it would be really cool to try to ride our bicycles from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Denver, Colorado. Not thinking for a moment that from the Oklahoma flatlands to Denver was straight up. And we had, I had a Hawthorne bike, which I think was a Montgomery Ward brand. He had a Schwinn, 26 inch coaster brake, one gear, newspaper baskets on the front. And we had to decide whether we were gonna ask permission. And we finally decided we wouldn't because we were gonna go anyway, whether our parents said no or not. And we were on the road for about four days, coming down this hill and almost to the panhandle. Oklahoma Highway Patrol car comes past us at the bottom of the hill. Car stops, OHP officer gets out, stands in the middle of that one westbound lane, holds up his hand. 
We stopped, and that officer uttered the immortal words, which one of y'all's long, which one of y'all's Coleman? (laughs) They had to get another OHP car because we had two bicycles, and only one bicycle of that kind with the big newspaper baskets on the front would fit in the trunk. And they took us back east, and why they never got all the way to Tulsa, I don't know. But they stopped in Pawnee County in the county seat of Pawnee, Oklahoma. Now, either Pawnee County didn't have a juvenile hall or the juvenile hall was full. And 12-year-old Ron, uh, 13-year-old Ron and 12-year-old me were booked into the Pawnee jail. Mug shots, fingerprints, taken downstairs where the jail cells were in the Tulsa police station. And our parents were wise enough, wise enough not to come get us for three days. <laughs> My oldest daughter became an honorary niece of Ron and He was an honorary uncle of the kids of my family. Lynette posted a Facebook thing on September 27th, and I think it captures the real Ron Coleman. She wrote, fair winds and following seas, Uncle Ron. You will always have the corner on the best memories of my earliest childhood and most formidable years. Thanks to you, I didn't stop at ER or RN medic. I kept going to maritime, field, flight, chemical weapons, always reaching for the stars. I promise you that on the eve of November the 10th, at midnight on the dot, that's the Marine Corps birthday, folks, I'll sing the now infamous, happy birthday, dear jarhead, Happy birthday to you. And I'll laugh at how long it didn't take you to call back when we hung up the first time. You are a class act, and because of you and Aunt Marie, we've named our dog Second Lieutenant Molly J. Klutz in honor of Murphy J. Klutz, the Irish setter that Ron and Marie had. You've made an impact on the world, fire, EMS, family. Semper Fi and Ura. I think Ron, the essence of Ron, can be summarized in four words. Three of them begin with H, one begins with T. The first H word is honest. You didn't need a qualification. Really honest, super honest. Ron Coleman was an honest man. The second word, beginning with H, is honorable. He led an an honorable life, personally, professionally. Some of us get that title when the governor appoints us to office. Ron earned it himself. The third word is humble. And as was mentioned a few moments ago, at all of the award ceremonies when Ron was receiving this award or that award, he didn't say, yeah, I, I did that. It was kind of tough, but I, but I finally did it. He would talk about the people who helped him do it, who had the idea, who brought the success of that effort. And the T word is trustworthy. All you needed with Ron was a handshake. You didn't need a piece of paper. If Ron said, I'll do that, and stuck out his hand, you could trust that handshake. Whatever he committed to would be done. He was the older brother I never had and a brother Marine. And Pastor, forgive the Marine Corps language. Damn, I'm going to miss him. Thank you very much. And now I guess it's my pleasure to introduce Dennis O'Neill.
Marie, Chris, Lisa, and your families, uh, Jen and I send our condolences to all of you. You know we loved Ron. He was a beloved friend uh, and mentor. And I have to admit that it's going to be pretty hard to add to what has already been said about Ron by the previous speakers. They've done a wonderful job describing his influence, the effect he's had on the fire profession, the effect that he's had on their professional lives. So I'm going to share with you a different view and talk about the devious, sneaky things <laughs> that he and I did. Now, Ron and I were friends, and, and he always believed that we were friends and equals, but he wasn't. He was really my mentor. We were never equal. Ron could soar where I would only crawl. Ron was someone who both knew and did the rarest of combinations. Hours of, combination, uh, hours of conversations flashed by in moments. An hour or a day with Ron Coleman taxed your brain. But it was about as much fun as you could have with your clothes on. Ron and I were complete opposites. Ron joined the Marine Corps at the cusp of the Vietnam War. I was an Army draftee at the height of the Vietnam War. Ron was a rifleman in the infantry, 0311. I was an infantry radio operator, 05 Bravo. That led to years of banter that only veterans and firefighters can have amongst themselves. And like firefighters assigned to engine, ladder, and rescue companies, branches of the military pick on each other. And that, through that banter, our relationship flourished. When I needed a sounding board, Ron was on speed dial. When he had a question about what was going on in Washington, he'd call. And we worked on a lot of issues over the years. But in our careers, we remained opposites. Ron was a West Coast fire chief. I was an East Coast fire chief. Ron dealt with West Coast politics in every city and every county named after a saint, where the loser of the election called the winner of the election and congratulated them. I dealt with East Coast politics, and uh, election day was a holy day of obligation, and the patron saint of Jersey City politics was Judas. <laughs> we long ago understood that getting anything done involved the right amount of tough politics, and genteel influence. And Ron did some amazing things. That's the devious, sneaky part of him. Through his books, his magazine articles, and his lectures, Ron got all of you to do the work he should have been doing. By sharing his ideas, he got everyone to improve firefighter and officer training, standardize college degree programs, develop a code of ethics, champion the technological innovations, encourage fire department accreditation, and individual professional certifications. His passions and his devious behaviors knew no bounds. And he did it at the national level. And let me tell you something. Politics at the national level is major league hardball. Spitballs are legal. They're always night games and sometimes they don't turn on the lights. Ron succeeded in that game because of his reputation. It was impeccable. He was always upright and honest. He never minced words. And he was a humble man in a world full of arrogance, a selfless man in a world full of ego, and a courageous man in a world filled with mediocrity. And now for some more sneaky stuff. From time to time, there would be some national fire issue that had to be fixed. One of us would call the other, and we combined the Saints of California and Jersey City politicians, stir in a few infantry tactics, and cook up some strategy that looked good enough to serve to the guards of the status quo, the we've always done it that way crowd. And together, we had some great fights, maybe a loss or two, but God, we love the fight. So I'm going to close with a story about great fights for my Marine Corps buddy. 19 days from now is October 25th, the Feast of St. Crispian. And October 25th 
in the year 1415, 608 years ago, there was a very famous battle during the 100 Years' War between England and France. King Henry of England was leading his soldiers against the French in a place called Agincourt. And King, ha King Henry's army didn't have any backups. They were all across the English, English Channel in England, and it was going to be a very, very tough fight. As a matter of fact, many soldiers knew that they were going to be making the supreme sacrifice. And King Henry and his troops were dealing with that. Some of his troops got afraid, and they deserted the army. And King Henry stood up before the rest of his troops to encourage him, encourage them, to stay and fight. To my mind, King Henry was talking about the fights that Ron took on. And according to Shakespeare, uh, this is what King Henry said. Today is the feast of St. Crispian, and he that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand taller when the day is named and inspire him when he hears the name Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil call his neighbors and say, today is the feast of St. Crispian. Then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. And gentlemen in England who are now in bed will curse themselves that they did not fight with us. And these stories the good man shall teach his son, and Crispian's day will never go by, but we in it will be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he who fights with me today shall be my brother. Semper Fi, Marine.
Wow, what an amazing life. And I want to thank each and every one of our speakers for sharing all of those details of your relationship with, with Ron. If I wasn't the MC, I could go on myself, but that's not my role tonight. At this time, I'd like to uh, ask Fire Chaplain Kent Craning back up for his message to the family. On August 27th, 2015, my uh, mother and father were getting ready to go get a cup of coffee. Mom had gone inside to get her wallet. My dad was in the car getting ready to back out of the driveway. When she came out, the car was out of the driveway and up the embankment across from their house, and he was slumped over the wheel. Uh, my mom called 911. Dispatch received the call and contacted Orange County Fire Station 10, and those guys did their job. They jumped up, and they got in Engine 10, and they came to our house. They found a very frantic woman who, in their line of work, is what happens, right? They come needing to have their best day when someone else is having their worst, and that was my mom. The engine company showed up and they began to work on my dad and one of the firemen who just did his job uh, was able to get a pulse back by the time they got to Placentia Linda Hospital in Yorba Linda. Uh, and the long story short is that they were able to revive my father and we were able to get nearly five more years. And not just mediocre years, but really good years. My dad came completely back from that. And that isn't everybody's story, so we took the time, my mom and my dad and I, to go to Station 10 and say thank you to that firefighter who was just doing his job. And I know at the same time, now that I am a chaplain for that battalion, and Engine 10 has a special place in my heart, I know that there's a sacrifice made for that of 48-hour shifts or 96-hour shifts or forced overtimes of missed events by family members and wives who wait at home wondering if they're gonna be okay in this particular event or that fire. And so the, the firemen and women in the service, the firefighters and everybody involved, they sacrifice, but so do the families. And so I, I stand here today not knowing the Coleman family, they don't know me, but I stand here today because I decided to get involved to say thank you to get involved, to give back wherever I can, to say thank you to the men and women who serve in these great organizations. And as I thought about that, I thought these, these days are hard because though my dad came back from that event, he eventually passed away a couple years ago. And we had a service much like this. I have one brother, so my mom sat down here and my brother and I here. And so as I come here, I don't know this family, but my heart aches in a certain way. And many of you here, probably you're here in part because you know the family from a distance maybe. Maybe you know intimately some of the speakers very close. But whatever your relationship, we all come here with a common thread of life and death. And so you may be sitting here and being reminded like I am of someone in your life. And you empathize with this family because you've been there. This is hard. And no matter what you believe about life and death and eternity in the Bible, there's a one-way door that awaits all of us. We all have an expiration date. I don't know when mine is. I hope it's down the road a ways. But even if we believe, as I do, what the Bible says, that there is a life after death, those days are hard. They're painful. Billy Graham summed it up this way. He said, life is hard, but God is good and heaven is real. I like that. It's simple. But I think in times like these, the Bible gives us permission, in fact, almost a command to say we should mourn with those who mourn. We should weep with those who weep. We should gather as a community and care for those who have lost loved ones. We should be there for one another. And even if you believe there's something more 
these days are hard. It's like reading a good book that you know there's a happy ending, but in chapter 7 and chapter 12, you cry because it's sad. And I think it's interesting because these days that, that sometimes break our heart are days that we would rather not see. If we're honest, we don't like them. We'd rather be someplace else. Not because or, or not because of the family, but simply because these days are hard. But it's interesting, Ecclesiastes 7.2 says, It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart. I don't know about you, but I read that, and I think that's backwards. I would much rather be at a party right now than a memorial service. I'd much rather be laughing than mourning, smiling than crying. But Ecclesiastes says it's actually better to be here right now, better for this family that we gather and support them and encourage them, share stories, but also better for all of us. See, the prospect of death is unsettling, and the process is also unsettling. I like what Woody Allen said. He said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. And Bono said, I'm just not good with death. And I think if we're honest, we probably all would just agree with that. We're not good with death. We don't talk about it. We don't want to face it. So I'd rather not go to a memorial. I'd rather go to a party. But also, if I'm honest, a party never changed my life. Not in a good way, anyway. Memorials have changed my life. See, a memorial forces us to ask questions that we don't otherwise ask. One of them is why. That's a hard one. Especially when death comes unexpectedly. The truth is, the why answers are never easy, they're rarely available, and they never really help. And they can get you stuck. I've met a lot of people stuck in the why did this have to happen? Why didn't God show up? Why this time? Why this way? How come? So I want to suggest to you in closing just three words, three questions that I think are better than the why question for all of us, not just the Coleman family. And then in honor of Ron, three Benjamin Franklin quotes the tie to that, although the interesting thing is if you begin Googling Benjamin Franklin quotes, there's a whole lot of quotes out there I don't think he actually said. So we'll just pretend like these were actually from him. The first word is decide. What do I believe about eternity? Benjamin Franklin said, fear not death, for the sooner we die, the longer we shall be immortal. Would you agree with that? I think most of us probably feel somewhere down in our gut that there's got to be more. I've done a lot of services. I've never had people not think about the after. We'll see this person again. They're free from the suffering, and they're in a better place. A lot of different language we use. We all have a sense that there's got to be something more. And if there is a life after death, where will you spend yours? These kind of days, if we let them, can cause us to ponder and at least take a moment to say, what do I believe? What do you believe about eternity? We need to decide. The second word is engage. How should I live tomorrow in light of today? It's a great, great poem about the dash. It's so short. Sometimes when I do gravesides, I just take a moment and and ponder the different stones that are there and look at the years. Some of them are so brief. How should I live tomorrow in light of today? Benjamin Franklin said, lost time can never be found again. I always wish I knew the person when I do these services, and even if I knew them, I didn't know everything. There's always some aspect of their life that I went, I did not know that was part of who they were. We need to make time to get to know people better. The most important thing we have in this life are relationships. And oftentimes, for a lot of lesser important reasons, we neglect them. So we need to be intentional about our families. We need to engage with our friends. And we need to consider how tomorrow might be different in light of today. And lastly, we need to remember, choose not to forget. Who do you know that right now could use a word of encouragement? Benjamin Franklin said this, we should not just think about ourselves. The whole world could use our help. 
I would say most of us are not going to impact the entire world, but all of us have somebody in our lives that could use a word of encouragement from us. I love the stories told of Ron's ability to help the other person a notch further up the ladder. But I think in this particular setting, I'm thinking specifically of this family. Some of you here know them very, very well, and you have their numbers. And it's great that you're here, but it's really important that you care for them a month from now, a year from now, at holidays, at days you know are going to be hard for Marie. And the family will be thinking, and it's good to have a friend who will call and say, hey, I was thinking about you today. Hey, got a funny story I remembered about Ron. I just wanted to share it with you. And sometimes we don't do that with people we care about because we think we're going to make them sad. But the reality is I've talked to enough people, and I myself included, who've lost a loved one who if you don't bring that person up anymore, they really think everybody else forgot them. And they have never forgotten them. They're about this far away from tears a lot of days. And to have a friend call and say, hey, I was thinking about him too. That, that can be worth a great deal. So if you know somebody, this family or somebody else who's lost a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe just a friend, not just a friend, whoever it is, make time. Take the time to visit. Make a phone call. Write a letter. Did you know that you can write on a piece of paper a note to someone and put it in an envelope with a stamp and it will still get to them today? And I don't know about you, but with all the technology, I'm still more prone to hang on to a handwritten note than I am anything else. Take the time to visit, to call, to send a letter. Decide what you believe about eternity. Engage how today will be different from other days, how tomorrow will be impacted by what happened here. And remember, who do you know that needs to be encouraged by you today? Let me pray this prayer blessing out of numbers over the Coleman family. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. At this time, we will move to fire department honors. Honor guard. the firefighter's prayer. When I am called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me strength to save a life, whatever be its age. Help me to embrace a little child before it is too late, or save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to be alert, to hear the weakest shout, and quickly and efficiently to put the fire out. I want to fill my calling and to give the best in me to guard my neighbor and protect his property. And if according to your will, I have to lose my life, bless with your protecting hand my children and my wife. The firefighter's last alarm. 
The men and women of today's fire service are confronted with a more dangerous work environment than ever before. We are forced to continually change our strategies and tactics to accomplish our tasks. Our methods may have changed, but the goals remain the same as they were in the past, to save lives and to protect property. Sometimes this is done at a terrible cost. However, this is what we do. This is the chosen profession. This is the tradition of the firefighter. The fire service of today is ever changing, but is steeped in traditions 200 years old. One such tradition is the sounding of a bell. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of that day's shift. To the day and night, each alarm was sounded by a bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizens. When the fire was out and all the tasks had come to an end, it was the bell that signaled to all the completion of that alarm. When a firefighter died in the line of duty, paying the supreme sacrifice, it was a mournful toll of the bell that tearfully announced the passing of a fellow firefighter. We utilize these traditions as symbols which reflect honor and respect for those who have given so much and who have served so well. To symbolize the devotion these brave souls had for their duty, a special signal of three rings, three times each, represents the end of a firefighter's duties and that they will be returning to quarters. Finally, to those who have devotedly given their lives for the good of their fellow citizens, their tasks completed, their duties well done. To Chief Ronnie Coleman, his last alarm, he is going home.
At this time, I'd like to introduce Fire Chaplain Jim Cook. Come up to the stage for the closing prayer. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we come before you and we say thank you for the life you gave to Ronnie J. Coleman. Lord, thank you for the heart and mind you gave him so they could carry out the things you purposed for him to do. Lord, thank you for the great opportunity to celebrate his life today. Thank you for his dedicated service to public service and thank you for his hard work as a California State Fire Marshal and for all the fire departments he's worked for. Lord, thank you for his military service in the Marine Corps. Father, he leaves behind family and friends and may they each experience your love and comfort as they walk through the loss. Lord, be with them each and every day. Let them feel your loving and strong presence in their hearts as they adjust to life without their loved one. We ask that your spirit will be their constant companion, assuring them of your love and care. God of comfort, let your presence be known to each one who suffers from the pain of this loss. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name, amen. As we close today's service, I promised Marie that I would convey a very important message while I have the opportunity. Marie and the Coleman family would like to express their heartfelt appreciation and gratitude for all of the support from everyone in this room and beyond. And a special thanks to Chief Walker and the incident management team who have worked tirelessly to make today a special day. She recognizes the hard work that has gone into providing such an honorable and respectful send off for Chief Coleman. She wanted to make me to make sure that you all know how grateful she and the Coleman family are. Also, I'd like to add a very big thank you to the Calvary South OC Church and staff for the use of their nice facilities and the support they provided. At this time, I'd ask that the Coleman family be dismissed, and I would also ask that everyone else remain seated while they exit. I would like to thank everybody for your attendance today. I'm sure the family appreciates every, each and every one of you being here today. At this time, we'll dismiss the rest of the group here. And as you exit, or as you leave the sanctuary, please make your way outside the church to join the Sea of Blue. Thank you. <laughs>